chairman. Good morning, guys. If the world is to increase energy security and avoid the worst impacts of global warming, a large-scale transition to a low-carbon energy economy will be necessary. To achieve success, governments, businesses, and the public must work together to increase energy efficiency and the use of renewable energy and decrease global warming. Uh, in ways that maintain economic vitality and create jobs. We must harness the power and creativity of the global economy to meet the global energy challenge. Business leaders, better known for green eye shades than fondness for granola, are increasingly asking governments around the world to adopt smart, long-term policies that ensure the true cost of energy and global warming is fully reflected in economic transactions and capital investment. They are seeking certainty for business decisions, but also the opportunity to make a buck. According to the Stern Review of the Economics of Climate Change, the value of the global environmental market could be $700 billion as soon as 2010 with the adoption of smart policies. Companies are already jockeying to gain the most advantageous position to capitalize on these new opportunities. Rather than a drain on the economy, uh, uh, energy and global warming policies can be a boon. The European Union has adopted ambitious mandates for increasing energy efficiency and renewable energy use and decreasing global warming pollution. Instead of hindering the EU's economy, it is roaring. As we have seen both in Europe and the United States, smart regulation drives innovation. In 1975, cars in the United States averaged just 13.5 miles per gallon. Fuel efficiency standards pushed the auto industry to innovate, and the fuel economy of cars rose to the height of 27.5 miles per gallon in 1987. In the 10 years from 1977 to 1987, U.S. oil imports dropped from 46.5% to 27 percent. Rather than build on that progress, efficiency standards have remained untouched for 20 years. Our reliance on imported oil has risen to 60 percent today, and dioxide emissions from the transportation se sector now make up a third of total global warming pollution in this country. After years of stagnation, Congress has an opportunity to move our vehicle fleet into the 21st century by passing a strong 35 miles per gallon fuel economy standard this fall. By 2030, the fuel economy language in the Senate Energy Bill would reduce American oil consumption by 4 million barrels per day, almost double what we currently import from the Persian Gulf, and reduce global warming pollution by more than 350 million tons per year. By passing the Energy Bill, that couples this language with an increase in the renewable fuel standard and establishes a renewable electricity standard, Congress can initiate the transformation of a low-carbon energy economy and make a significant down payment on the reduction of global warming pollution necessary to save the planet. The United States and the United Kingdom have been described as divided by a common language. But as we will hear from our witnesses today, Business leaders from both countries are united on the need for energy and global warming policies to drive innovation and investment towards the creation of a low-carbon energy economy. I look forward to their testimony, and I will now uh, recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Global warming is a complicated problem that can't be solved by the United States alone. International partnerships must be an essential part of any global warming policy, and I am pleased that today's hearing will feature the perspective of two CEOs from the United Kingdom who will be able to add some of insight from across the pond. Technology will be another essential part of any successful global warming policy, and all four of today's witnesses will be able to give us more perspective on the technology that holds the best hope of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Because it's clear that there will be a continued demand for energy from increased economic growth here and around the world, it is clear that the technological breakthroughs are the only real way for countries around the world to continue to meet their energy demands without raising greenhouse gas output. 
While today's witnesses may share some views on technology, it seems that there are at least some differences between them. Some investors have different ideas than others about where the future of technology may go. Some consumers will obviously have different ideas about what type of cars they want to drive, and perhaps they won't be the same ideas as government regulators in Washington, London, or other parts of the world. I support the development of these new technologies, and I want nothing to stand in their way, especially government mandates. While I agree with our witnesses that technology needs substantial further development, I am afraid I don't think government mandates will get us there. By picking winners and losers, the government could act to block worthwhile technology development while advancing substandard technology. It is far too early for Congress or any government regulators to begin deciding what technology will be right for our future energy needs. Another concern I have with mandates is that it will result in economic harm. Technological transitions can benefit the economy, and the Internet's example of that. However, if government regulations trust technology into an economy that's not yet ready for it, the results will likely be havoc. I believe that the free market is powerful enough to sort out the variety of emerging new technologies then integrate them into the economy without hitting our constituents in the wallet. At the end, we all want to see greenhouse gas reductions, but getting there is not going to be easy. One recent report from a group called Open Europe shows that European-based facilities covered by the EU emissions trading scheme have actually seen an increase in CO2 emissions by 1%. While that's not a tremendous increase, it is certainly not a reduction either, and it goes to show what a difficult task lies ahead. And nowhere does this task become more difficult than dealing with countries like China and India, whose emissions continue to grow. Already one report puts China's total emissions ahead of the U.S. Countries like China and India will need revolutionary technology of their own in order to slow their emissions growth. There will be an increasing demand for cutting-edge energy technology in the United States and Europe, Asia, else, and elsewhere around the world. So there will clearly be business opportunities. I'm just concerned that if the government gets into that business like it has in Europe, the result might not be the ones we expected or hoped to achieve. I thank the gentleman. Yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Looking forward to the conversation today, the gentlemen that are represented here today uh, are part of what I think is the perhaps the single most important element we will be dealing with in climate change, and that's the billions of decisions that are made every day by businesses and consumers uh, in our country and around the world. Um, I am interested in being able to explore with them the way that the government can provide a framework to help advance this, to give stability to business, to send a signal about where we're going. I'm pleased to represent a community of Portland, Oregon, where there is a strong commitment to uh, green business uh, initiatives, sustainable development, and trying to have a, a regulatory framework for energy, transportation, and housing that helps those pieces work together. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation here, and I appreciate your scheduling the hearing. Thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I appreciate the witnesses be here. Uh, you know, when you think about this, America does well anytime there is a large uh, economic transition and technological transition, and that has been our forte. It's where we've had our growth. When there's a transition to aeronautics, we have done very well. Where there's a transition in the internet, we have done very well. And now, when we go into a transition to to uh, other than carbon-based fuels, we're going to do very well if. If the U.S. Congress adopts free market principles that my friend Mr. Sensenberger uh, referred to when it comes to the limited capacity of the atmosphere to carry CO2, and that's why I hope that uh, all of us here will work on a cap-and-trade system that uses the power of the market to drive these technologies forward once there's a price of carbon associated with a, quote, market, a free market on the carrying capacity for CO2, and I look forward to getting that done. I just want to note that um, folks have entered this discussion with fear, and uh, I enter it with amazement at how smart people are. Every time I turn around, there's a new technology. I just got a little Blackberry about a group uh, called Canarca that's developing a clear uh, photovoltaic uh, technique for actually clear windows. 
I mean, it's just amazing what's going on out there, and I look forward to a way to help these folks move forward. Great. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, like the other members uh, assembled here on the dais, I look forward to uh, the discussion. I have a keen interest in uh, fuel cell technology, but um, also am interested in the contrast and discussion that exists down here between a cap and trade system and a and a carbon uh, tax. Uh, and interested in what the panelists uh, have to say about that in terms of. Uh, uh, the dynamics, the leverage, and uh, how successful they think, for example, the European Union's efforts are. And I want to commend the chairman again for uh, his efforts in putting this panel together. I thank the gentleman. Um, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for calling the hearing. I'd like to express appreciation to our guests for being here. Uh, I'm particularly excited about your presence uh, because of uh, the advancements that we've seen uh, in the EU. Uh, and of course, Chancellor uh, Merkel uh, calling for uh, the, the need for a global emissions trading system. And I'm uh, certainly interested in, in whether or not you think that's practical uh, and workable. Uh, and, of course, the, the, uh, the issues that, that we face here are global because there's no such thing as pollution uh, and greenhouse gases just settling over uh, uh, parts of the world. And so we look forward to your, uh, your statements and, and, a, and, and the, the opportunity to become dialogical. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognized the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing. And I thank the panelists. Some have come from quite a distance uh, to participate. This is an important topic because it brings both the international players in and uh, strong business interests. It's my strong belief uh, that the solutions to global warming uh, will make us more prosperous and sustainable. It will create jobs and enhance international cooperation and understanding. I look at this as an opportunity to be exploited in making this a better world. Uh, we here in the United States can learn from Europe's experience and from known business successes. With that, I look forward uh, to a future of cooperation and understanding and yield back the balance of my time. I, I thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the general lady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I certainly want to thank all the witnesses as well for your attendance today. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, listening to you as you share your expertise. Uh, coming from Michigan, the home of the domestic auto industry, I'm especially uh, interested to hear the testimony regarding the economic impact of legislation on vehicle technologies. Uh, I do believe that there may be a number of business opportunities in, low carbon in a low carbon economy. However, as you might imagine, I'm also very concerned uh, by some of the proposals that we should enact legislation to mandate a low carbon economy. These proposals are making the assumption that the low carbon technologies exist or will exist in the near future and that uh, some of these proposals, people would assume that the reason that these technologies have not yet been delivered is because businesses do not choose to develop or integrate them into their business model. And obviously one of the lead examples of this is in the domestic auto industry. Um, constantly uh, suggesting that if CAFE standards were increased or other form of binding legislation were enacted that the automotive industry would just respond with technologies to meet these demands. However, the burden that these regulations would place upon the domestic auto industry uh, could be very severe, particularly at a time when it is well known about the uh, decline that is happening, uh, the economic transition uh, that is happening to the domestic auto industry. So I, I would just, uh, as I say, I'm very interested to hear uh, all of the uh, different expertise uh, on this issue. I think it is uh, uh, clear what is happening uh, uh, in other countries around uh, the world where they are investing in uh, R&D and uh, new alternative technologies, uh, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, our uh, country really looks to the domestic auto industry to do all of the R&D themselves, to work it into their business model, and to produce cars that they're customers may not be interested in purchasing. So I will be very interested to hear your testimony. And thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Great. General, General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the General Lady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Samlin. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this very important hearing. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and exploring with them uh, the business opportunities that do exist based on their experience and insight in a low carbon energy economy, uh, but more specifically in representing a rural district, a farm state, uh, the role that American agriculture and rural America uh, can play in helping find solutions and what the business opportunities are in a low carbon energy economy in reducing greenhouse gases, what the role of American agriculture can be, whether it be certain farming practices or grazing practices as it relates to participation in a cap and trade system, if indeed the United States ultimately adopts one. Uh, so this is an area, whether it's biofuels, wind and solar, carbon storage, that I look forward to exploring with our witnesses today. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, again, for holding this important hearing. Great. General Lady, um, his time has expired, and all time for opening statements has expired, so we'll now turn to our very distinguished uh, panel. And I would first like to recognize Ralph Izzo, who is the Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Public Service Enterprise Group Incorporated um, since April of 2007. Um, this is uh, a company which um, has uh, electric generating capacity in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Texas, California, New Hampshire, and uh, Hawaii. Um, uh, he first joined PSEG in 1992 and has served in a number of leadership positions in that company. Uh, he is trained as a physicist, uh, and he has also spent time in the offices of Senator Bill Bradley and New Jersey Governor Tom Kane working on science and technology policy. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Izzo. Whenever you're ready, please begin. If you could push the button down there to uh, turn on your microphone. Thank you. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee, I am honored to appear before you today on behalf of PSEG. As the chairman has already told you, PSEG is an energy services company headquartered in New Jersey. But in addition to our regulated utility, we own and operate competitive electric generating consisting of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power. We believe that climate change is the preeminent challenge of our time, and with it comes significant business opportunities and responsibility. Our company has been a leader in the effort to limit greenhouse gases for more than 15 years. Some of the steps we have taken include being the first utility in the country to sign a pre-Kyoto voluntary greenhouse gas reduction accord. We voluntarily agreed in 2004 to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 18 percent from 2000 levels by 2008. And we've been a leading advocate for a national economy-wide cap-and-trade program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020 and 80 percent below current levels by 2050. We are also improving the efficiency of our own electric delivery system. Some initiatives include investing in state-of-the-art distribution cables and energy-efficient transformers, using a biodiesel fuel blend in our vehicle fleet, and replacing 1,300 cars and light trucks with hybrid electrics and retrofitting 450 bucket trucks with electric drives to power the lifts. Mr. Chairman, if you ask whether climate policies have influenced our business decisions and whether we think there are significant opportunities for businesses to participate in the climate challenge ahead, the answer is a resounding yes. To do so, PSEG and other companies will need to apply our expertise in new ways to reduce energy demand, spur development of renewable resources, and develop carbon-free central station power. In short, we will have to change the way we run our businesses and enter into a new era of collaboration with state and federal policymakers. Energy efficiency offers one such opportunity but it will require a new regulatory compact. These are investments that can be made right now using existing technology. For example, in 1970, a typical refrigerator consumed around 2,000 kilowatt hours of electricity annually. Today, an Energy Star refrigerator of the same size consumes about one-fifth of that amount. The problem is that customers are not making decisions to invest in, en in energy efficiency opportunities like this refrigerator. Energy utility companies are uniquely positioned to change this dynamic by investing in energy saving appliances and fixtures ourselves and receiving compensation as we do for investing in pipes and wires. 
Consider the fact that utilities engage in millions of interactions with customers daily and employ a highly skilled workforce that can be engaged to promote efficiency. Also, utilities can make long-term investments and can assure that all customers, especially low-income customers, benefit from energy efficiency. On the renewable energy front, front, PSEG has requested state approval to invest $100 million to finance solar projects in New Jersey. PSEG proposes to provide loans to solar developers, making solar energy more accessible and affordable for households and businesses. We are also anxious to explore direct investment in solar energy if Congress enacts the provision in the energy tax package that allows utilities to claim the investment tax credit available to others at present. Mr. Chairman, I conclude by saying what you already know. For the U.S. to meaningfully address climate change, a uniform national greenhouse gas reduction policy that establishes a market price for carbon is needed. This will drive development of new low-carbon technologies. This should be a single, economy-wide cap-and-trade program and a single greenhouse gas trading market with consistent emissions reduction targets across all states. Congress should take its cue from the 10-state regional greenhouse gas initiative and develop a comparable national program that will render regional programs unnecessary. By comparable, I mean requirements that are at least as stringent as the so-called Reggie states. Other key components of a national program should include transitioning to a federal allowance auction over a 10-year period and using proceeds to fund research and development and low-income assistance programs allocating a portion of allowances at no cost to electric generators based on an updating output-based output formula. This approach will spur investment in higher efficiency power plants and provide incentives for investing in advanced, low, and zero-carbon technologies. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to participate in these important hearings. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Izzo, uh, very much. Uh, before turning to our next two witnesses, who are members of the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change, um, I would like to um, include in the record a letter that uh, Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, has um, sent to the Select Committee. Uh, members have a copy of the full letter, which is in front of them. Uh, I would like to just uh, read a brief excerpt uh, uh, from Prince Charles's letter to us. Um, he said, I have been following with the greatest attention the most recent policy evolutions in key industrialized countries. To secure the future for generations to follow, I hope that the boldest possible targets can be set together with the policies needed to implement them. Otherwise, how can we expect developing countries such as India and China to take action? The legally binding targets that will be put in place in the United Kingdom through the Climate Change Bill, together with those being put in place in the state of California, and steps being undertaken in numerous other states and cities in the United States are evidence of how policymakers are both in both our countries are moving to address this problem. A challenge of the magnitude of climate change requires a coordinated response based on actions across every sector of society and the business community is going to be critical in achieving this. The companies which are members of my corporate leaders group are playing a highly strategic role, essentially helping to create a political space in which effective policies can be introduced and global progress can be achieved. I very much hope that the hearing this week will be productive and that members of my corporate leaders group will be able to work with members of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming in the future to develop further policy responses to the most pressing of problems. This brings you my warmest good wishes, uh, Prince Charles. So we thank him for that letter, and we thank um, uh, the next two witnesses for coming here uh, today. Uh, and I would like to recognize a member of the Management Committee for the Prince's uh, Business uh, and Environment Program and the Chief Executive of Johnson uh, uh, Mathey, uh, Neil Carson. He joined the company in 1980 and has served in a variety of positions within the company and on the board before becoming CEO in 2004. He is currently the chairman of the Business Task Force on Sustainable Consumption and Production. Uh, Mr. Carson, welcome, and whenever you're ready, please begin. Chairman, 
Chairman Markey, thank you very much, and thank you, members of the uh, Select Committee. This is an important issue, uh, energy independence and global warming, uh, and I'm very honored to be here to present uh, evidence. Uh, as the Chairman stated, my name's Neil Carson. I'm Chief Executive of Johnson Matthey and a, a member of the Corporate Leaders Group, which I represent today. Johnson Matthey is a specialty chemical company. Uh, it's nearly 200 years old. Uh, our core skills are in catalysis, uh, in precious metals, and in, uh, in fine chemistry. Uh, and our largest business, as many of you will be aware, is in the business of autocatalyst, uh, that is supplying uh, catalysts to the exhausts of uh, cars, uh, lately trucks and buses also have been included in the legislative uh, framework, uh, and other pollution control systems. Uh, also, we're a developer of uh, fuel cell technology and have been for many years. Our business model at Johnson Matthey is to invest in R&D, to invest in technology, uh, and this, we hope, will maintain uh, our leadership positions in our markets uh, by really continuously improving the performance of our products and then better servicing our, our customers as a, as a result. Uh, I won't go into uh, great detail about the rest of Johnson Matthey's business because uh, I think the main point of uh, my evidence today to you uh, is that both Johnson Matthey and the Corporate Leaders Group uh, believe that to address climate change and energy independence, uh, industry and government needs to work together uh, and that time is of the essence uh, and that uh, our goals can be met uh, at the same time as uh, growing our, uh, our economies and growing prosperity. Uh, the idea is, uh, is not a new one. Uh, the idea to set long-term and binding legislation, uh, in this case uh, for CO2 emissions, uh, is, a, is a powerful uh, incentive then for industry like ours and others uh, to invest in technology to find solutions uh, to that uh, issue. And I've got a, a, a classic example which doesn't really need to be uh, raised at, at this meeting, but of course California uh, in 1970 realized that its uh, uh, environment uh, was, not host was hostile to human life uh, and was the, uh, uh, it was identified that cars uh, were the culprit. Uh, and they set uh, demanding legislation into the future, five years ahead. Uh, uh, and uh, made it clear that that's in order to sell cars in California, that <coughs> legislation would need to be met. They didn't have uh, a, a very much idea about how the legislation would be met, nor do I think they uh, cared much. They didn't choose a technology. They just set the outcome that they wanted uh, from, uh, in terms of reduced emissions from, from vehicles. That was in 1970, and, uh, and from 1970 to today, uh, the population has grown 38% uh, in California. The miles traveled has grown 155%. Uh, GDP has grown 164%, uh, but the relevant emissions have fallen 31%. Uh, a good example that prosperity can uh, thrive over the years, uh, and that is, this has been a low-cost uh, exercise for, for California. Now, I think we can do the same thing with CO2. Uh, there are many mechanisms. Uh, the cap and, a tra a cap and trade mechanism has been, uh, has been mentioned today. There's, of course, tax, taxation as well as, a, as an option. Uh, however, however it's, it's done, for it, from an industrial perspective, uh, the essence w must be to set clear targets for the future and then not pick a technology, not pick a winner, but allow uh, business to, uh, to find a solution. Uh, the solution will be higher cost than currently, uh, but perhaps not as high cost as uh, clearing up the, uh, the mitigating, uh, mitigating for the effects of global warming uh, looking forward as identified by the Stern Review. Uh, other issues for, uh, for electricity generators are uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, uh, these are technically possible, uh, feasible, uh, but expensive um, uh, mechanisms, uh, but again, they can be invested in because of uh, the cost of future emissions from carbon. That brings to the end my, uh, my summary. Uh, climate change is an urgent issue. With wealth comes responsibility. Uh, we should look after the planet for the future 
for future generations, and the Corporate Leaders Group looks forward to working with governments, your government, and other governments to find the solutions. Uh, thank you, sir, very much. Um, and I would now like to recognize Alain Grisset. He is Chief Executive of F&C Asset Management. Uh, he was also appointed an Executive Director and a member of the Executive Committee of Friends Provident uh, on January uh, of 2006. Prior to um, joining FNC in April of 2001, uh, uh, Alain uh, Grisset was at uh, J.P. Morgan for 20 years as a Managing Director responsible for the investment bank's market client business in Europe. Uh, Mr. Grisset, uh, please begin when you're ready. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, on behalf of FNC Management and fellow members of the UK and EU Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify before the Congressional Committee on Energy, Independence and Global Warming. FNC is a leading European asset management company nearly 140 years old, that serves a wide range of institutional and retail customers with assets over $200 billion. Our mission is to deliver competitive investment returns to our clients and to act on their behalf to ensure that investee companies generate profits for their shareholders while ensuring that their businesses will be around for the long term. We take our role as active investors very seriously, and in so doing, do not shy away from taking a strong stand on matters of public policy, where we believe these to be of vital interest <laughs> to our clients. Climate change is one such issue. I have traveled here today from London to share with you the fruits of our thinking and experience, both as an institutional investor and as a business that has played a leading role in voicing the concerns of business to UK and EU policymakers on climate change. My message is simple. Business and investors can only play their part in tackling climate change if government takes decisive action to make this possible. The cost of moving forward today in a planned and deliberate way are modest and will even yield profitable business opportunities for many innovative companies along the way. These costs are dwarfed by the cost of inaction when one considers the human, natural, and economic consequences of a business-as-usual approach. In short, we simply cannot put our hands in the sand. Most important of all, this problem will not get solved through market forces alone in the time that we have left to act because climate change presents a textbook example of market failure. This means that voluntary targets won't do. Business needs a level playing field in order to take on the financial risk that adequate action on climate change require. Business will play a pivotal role in marshalling capital to fund the innovative technologies that will overcome climate change, but it needs government to set clear long-term rules and standards. I have therefore come here to ask you, as legislators of the most powerful nation, to play an historical part in this effort. Only with long-term legislative clarity can investment companies like mine return to their day jobs and begin the task of shifting capital on the scale that is needed to transform the global economy to one that runs on low carbon energy. What does this mean in practice? That we investors and the companies in which we invest need the US government to first define climate change policy as a top national priority 
and set binding national targets that will be translated into clear long-term rules, regulations, and standards. Secondly, play a leadership role in engaging other national governments to establish binding global targets and standards. And thirdly, to introduce policy instruments, including cap and trade mechanisms, fiscal measures, and regulatory standards that will result in a viable carbon price. So long as carbon is valued at zero, capital investment in innovative, low carbon technologies will remain embryonic and fail to deliver the economic transformation that is needed. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we have two choices. We can act now with the benefit of a bit of time and planning, thereby enabling business to manage the transition efficiently and government to cushion the blow for those affected by the inevitable disruption. Or we can act later and pay a much higher price. There is no third option. Innovative companies and investors stand ready to act, but we cannot compromise our economic survival without clear signals from government that reflect the new economic reality. I hope that the work of this committee will enable you to lead your nation and the community of nations in embracing this challenge and create the conditions for business to play its vital role in delivering the solutions to climate change. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Grisset. Uh, and I would like to now recognize our final witness, Jonathan Lash. He is president of the World Resources Institute and a founder of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership. In 2005, Rolling Stone described him as the environmentalist who has done the most to bridge the bitter divide between industry interests and green groups determined to halt global warming. His long career in state and federal government and environmental organizations as a litigator and a leader is a testament to this well-deserved description. We welcome you, Mr. Lash, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and particularly appreciate the, the energy the committee is putting into addressing a, a compellingly important issue for the country uh, to develop legislation that will be both in our national environmental interest and in our national economic interest. I, I think that's really our subject today. My organization, the World Resources Institute, is an environmental think tank that works on global issues, including global climate change, and has partnered with businesses for 15 years, uh, developing uh, low-carbon alternatives, finding ways for them to reduce emissions, to purchase green power, uh, and developing the accounting protocol, which virtually all companies that measure greenhouse gases now use uh, to measure and report greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I am here today on behalf of the United States Climate Action Partnership, uh, a group that now includes six national environmental organizations and 27 uh, companies from virtually every sector, uh, including GE, GM, Ford, Chrysler, Caterpillar, uh, six utilities, including Duke Energy, the third largest user of coal in the United States, uh, DuPont, Dow, Pepsi, Rio Tinto, uh, which is the third largest producer of coal in the United States, Conoco, John Deere, and many others. The group um, last January issued a call to action, uh, which uh, first of all emphasized our agreement that climate change is real, immediate, and urgent. In fact, it is proceeding more quickly than the scientists uh, predicted with impacts uh, that are occurring earlier than we expected. Uh, the group, of course, shares the committee's perception that we must and can address climate change in ways that help the U.S. economy uh, to uh, move forward and compete uh, when tomorrow's markets began to, uh, begin to demand low-carbon alternatives. Specifically, 
the United States Climate Action, Action Partnership has recommended that Congress adopt a mandatory economy-wide cap-and-trade system that uh, slows, uh, stops, and then reverses the growth in U.S. emissions that achieves 10 to 30 percent reductions within 15 years and 60 to 80 percent reductions by 2050. Uh, the group uh, urges the inclusion of the capacity to use offsets uh, in order to meet uh, reduction targets and that the policy be complemented by other policies to accelerate efficiency improvements and advance technology. So why? Why are 27 major companies, many of them heavy energy users and heavy coal users, uh, recommending stringent action on climate change? First, they believe we have to act and that it's better to get started sooner, that delay will be expensive and increase the eventual cost to them. Second, they want to compete in tomorrow's markets and they believe tomorrow's markets will be demanding low carbon technology, services and products. There will be booming demand. They want to be there to meet that demand. Third, they are making massive technology investments in technology that will be in use for 50 years, and they want to know what the rules will be in the fu future. Fourth, uh, they need a carbon price. Uh, you've already heard several times from this panel the importance of a carbon price. If we want to let the market choose winning technologies, the market has to have a price signal uh, to be able to do it. Finally, they want a level playing field. We now have 17 states that represent the majority of the U.S. economy that are imposing their own carbon restrictions. It's an impossible environment for multinational companies to operate in in the United States. I would make uh, one quick comment that does not represent uh, the U.S. Climate Action Partnership uh, findings. Um, since you are in the final process of approval of an energy bill, um, there are extraordinarily important provisions in the energy bill which would help both energy security and climate change. Uh, those include efficiency measures and, and renewable measures. Uh, but it's important to realize that not all measures that would improve energy security will help with climate change. An example is the proposed uh, subsidies for coal to liquids. Since the process of producing liquid fuel from coal is energy intensive, uh, it results in far higher uh, GHG emissions than other liquid fuel alternatives. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lash, very much. The Chair will now recognize himself for a round of questions. We'll begin with you, Mr. Izzo. Um, PG&E is primarily a northern company. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had the vice president of the southern company um, who testified uh, before us. Um, he told us that solar energy would not work uh, for the southern company down in Florida and Georgia. Uh, and yet we hear from you today up in New Jersey and the states surrounding New Jersey that you're in, making a massive investment in solar energy. And it's, it seems kind of curious because I think that New Jersey seniors, as they leave New Jersey to go to Florida, say the same thing that Massachusetts seniors say as they leave for Florida, which is, I hate the winters up here. I I'm going to Florida. So, why is it that you, a northern company, can make such a massive investment so optimistically in solar energy, but the southern company says that it won't work down there? Well, I, I can't speak for the southern company. I, I could tell you the logic that we put into this. Uh, solar energy will work in New Jersey. Its estimate, depending upon assumptions you make, is that it would cost anywhere from $5,000 to $8,000 per kilowatt. That is more expensive than conventional gas-fired power. <coughs> So one could take the approach that, quote, it doesn't work. I would simply say it's more expensive. However, that would be looking at only one side of the equation. Clearly, the benefits of solar are not only in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, but also in terms of traditional pollutant reductions, uh, NOx, SO2, mercury, fine particulates. So it's our responsibility, I believe, to educate consumers that while there are some places, energy efficiency, where you can improve the environment and lower costs, there are other 
technologies where improving the environment will result in higher costs, but it will work. Okay. Now, um, we just uh, voted in the House um, a standard that would be national, 11 percent renewable electricity by 20 20 and 4 percent from efficiency. Can you meet that up in New Jersey? The answer to that is yes. The, the, the question that others will ask is at what cost? And my response is that's for policymakers to decide. We will do it at the least cost possible. But the answer to your question, Mr. Chairman, is yes, we can meet it. And I think through using utilities who have a lower cost of capital, more patient capital, longer amortization schedules, and by removing the investment tax credit exclusion, which right now undermines utilities' ability to invest in that, we can do it at the least cost for customers. Okay, thank you. Mr. Carson, um, we're also debating uh, auto efficiency here in the United States. Could you bring us up to speed on what's going on in Europe? What are the standards that are being debated uh, across the EU? Yes, uh, certainly, uh, Chairman. The, um I don't have the actual numbers uh, to, to hand, but they, uh, we talk in uh, Europe about uh, fuel economy in terms of grams of CO2 per kilometer. Uh, and I think the average for the fleet uh, is about uh, 160 grams uh, of CO2 per kilometer. And I would imagine that relates to about 40 miles to get to the gallon, maybe, uh, maybe slightly more. I think that compares to the uh, fuel economy in the US of maybe 20. Uh, again, I don't have those figures uh, to hand, but they're rough uh, numbers. The, um, the, the uh, automakers in, um, in Europe have been working uh, to a voluntary uh, program to reduce uh, their uh, emissions of CO2 for the fleet, uh, and that's had some success, but uh, uh, more recently the, government has decided, the governments have decided they want more success than that and have, uh, have, are pressing the car companies to reduce from 160 to around 140 in a couple of years' time and then 120, uh, and ultimately to, uh, to below 100. Uh, so very significant miles per gallon that that, uh, that equates to. Um, having made that announcement earlier in the year, the Frankfurt Motor Show, uh, which was in September, uh, it was interesting to note that every single car company showcased uh, high uh, fuel efficiency vehicles. Uh, so these fuel efficiency vehicles are, uh, are available. Uh, of course, uh, it's easy to blame the car companies for, um, uh, for, for selling uh, vehicles that don't have uh, uh, high efficiency. Uh, and that, so the consumers take some blame here in what they want to, uh, to purchase. I accept that point. Uh, but um, uh, the other thing that's happened in Europe is that there's been a push to diesel vehicles, which are 19% more fuel efficient on a like-for-like -like basis. And now 50% of new car sales in Europe are uh, for diesel fueled vehicles, uh, up from something like 32% five years ago. So quite a dramatic change in the engine type used in Europe. My time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you very much, and I'll follow up on uh, my chairman's uh, comments and, and Mr. Carson. As I mentioned to you, coming from the Motor City, Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, Michigan, I obviously have a very large interest in this, and I appreciate the fact that you were trying to articulate the uh, differences in um, what we have as a government regulation for cafe, cafe standards, as we call them here, and uh, in Europe, of course, they are voluntary. I, I will uh, just make a personal observation as you travel through um, many of the major European cities, whether it's Brussels or Berlin or Rome or whatever, you see all these buildings that are practically black, blackened. Uh, we don't have that here, uh, and, and that obviously has had an impact. And I'm not sure how all the voluntary standards are working there, but I certainly uh, commend uh, the European automobile industry to be looking at, at doing these kinds of things uh, as well. I might uh, ask if I could, uh, when and you mentioned in your comments, uh, Mr. Carson, as well, about that you were uh, heavily invested in hydrogen fuel cell technologies, uh, et cetera. Uh, perhaps you could uh, flesh that out a bit for me on how does, um, how, do, how does your company interact with your government as far as any uh, research and development dollars, uh, either for uh, hydrogen fuel cell or lithium ion batteries or some of the various alternative energy sources? Well, uh, firstly, the, the comment on the black buildings, if I, if I may, in, uh, in Europe, there, I, don't, I don't know uh, the cause exactly of, of that, but the, um, the latest technology, which has been driven by, by legislation for the emissions of diesel vehicles, 
uh, it's now possible to get diesel vehicles to exactly the same uh, emissions uh, performance as petrol vehicles. Uh, and uh, that's in, uh, for uh, US uh, legislative uh, limits uh, too. So um, I think that the emissions from diesel and petrol vehicles uh, in the future will actually be the same. Uh, so not a differentiating factor. Uh, we work, uh, the fuel cell uh, business is focused on uh, many uh, applications. The biggest one in the future, we believe, will be cars. Uh, and we're stimulated to work on fuel cells by the car companies who uh, uh, pretty much all have some kind of programs to, uh, to um, uh, put fuel cell engines into vehicles at some stage uh, in the future. This is quite a long-term issue. I think influential here has been California. Uh, in driving towards uh, zero emission vehicles, uh, which the car companies obviously have their, uh, their eye on. Uh, so our main motivation is to work with our, our customers. Uh, we are the recipients and grateful to be the recipients of some government funds in the area of, uh, uh, of fuel cells, but our main, uh, our main expense and our main driver uh, is through our desire to develop products for uh, future generation uh, cars and residential buildings uh, in uh, co co collaboration with our customers. Thank you. Uh, another difference, of course, between our two uh, uh, continents is, is the way that we tax uh, the usage of, uh, of gasoline and petrol, and a huge tax burden in the European, uh, in the EU, which we don't have here, although there's a lot of talk about using uh, taxes as a, uh, a way to disincent uh, driving. Um, one of the things I, I think is very important uh, between the U.S. and the EU is that we do have a overlay, a mesh of the regulatory standards between our two uh, economies and uh, that we don't have any kind of uh, unintended consequences uh, with some of the various regulatory policies that we've had as we did with the Sarbanes-Oxley unfortunately with the financial services sort of an overreaction I guess in, in some ways and uh, we didn't really talk to our European friends uh, about that so we want to make sure in the environmental area that uh, we do so. Um, could I, I, if I could ask a question again to the uh, my European uh, friends here, and we certainly appreciate uh, you coming. I was very interested in what is happening with the focus of the European, uh, of the entire EU really on, on the airline industry, although that's apparently only 3% of the emissions uh, that you, that you uh, as you've uh, interpolated it there, but yet there's a huge focus in, in Europe really to, uh, to utilize the emissions trade uh, if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I noticed in your written background, Mr. Uh, Grisset, uh, that you were saying the emissions trading scheme really hadn't delivered on its promise. How, how is all that working? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting point. Um, it's certainly one that attracts a lot of attention in the public and a, a growing awareness of the public in respect of the responsibility of airline companies, and you see quite a bit of lobby in that respect. Um, as a fund manager, I can assure you that, for instance, in the case of the socially responsible funds that we run, and they happen to be the largest in Europe, we exclude investments in airline companies for that reason. Um, I think that it is also linked to a degree to the growing success in public, alternative public transportation, and in particular fast trains. So um, this is indeed a comprehensive review of what the alternatives are and certainly a growing pressure for greater efficiency. I don't believe airlines will disappear. I don't believe we should stop flying. But putting pressure on both airlines and airports for greater efficiency is certainly the right thing to do. Thank you. Has my time expired? Great. Yes, time Thank has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The ladies' time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rizzo, in your testimony, uh, you indicate uh, that there's going to be a paradigm shift that's going to be necessary in terms of how utilities are regulated uh, to provide some incentives for reasonable return on energy efficiency. In my uh, community, uh, our gas company actually was a pioneer in uh, decoupling uh, to uh, disconnect the uh, rate of return from just the volume of gas. Are there other specific ideas that occur to you that uh, we should be considering in terms of changing that regulatory scheme? Yes, decoupling is a necessary but not sufficient condition, to use an old mathematics expression, in that it holds the utility harmless. But today, if I invest in a bigger wire so that more electricity <coughs> will flow, I can get a return on that investment. 
if I subsidize a compact fluorescent light bulb, I get zero return on that investment. It's strictly what's known as a pass-through. There's only so much time in a the day. There's only so much management attention I can put to certain things. And at the end of the day, I have to show a certain amount of earnings growth. So I tend to, therefore, focus on the things that produce the, uh, the profitability that my investors seek. So what I would encourage is truly putting energy efficiency on a level playing field with supply options and allowing you to at least earn returns on energy efficiency investments. I would welcome some thoughts that you or any of the other panel members may have in specific ways that we might adjust the state regulatory schemes. This looks to me to be one of the real gaps, mm -hmm. and I, for one, am willing to uh, uh, encourage higher rates of return for the types of behaviors we want. Uh, the specifics would be of great interest. Uh, Mr. Lash, um, on page five of your testimony, you've got these, all the, this, uh, these uh, charts here that... The bubble chart. The bubble charts. There's one bubble I noticed that wasn't there, um, and that was vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we've got uh, people, uh, Urban Land Institute, Smart Growth America, a number of folks who have done an analysis that suggests that even if the chairman's uh, CAFE standards are reached, um, that the increase in vehicle, exponential increase in vehicle miles traveled from outdated regulatory schemes, land use patterns, and fewer transportation choices for folks will overwhelm any energy savings. Um, do you have any thoughts about uh, the missing bubble and uh, policy initiatives that might help uh, re address that balance? I do. I, I would make two comments. First, the explanation of why the bubble isn't there is in order to make it readable, we tried to only portray those policy initiatives that seem to be immediately before the Congress. So we put CAFE there because there was an ongoing debate on CAFE, the same with coal liquids. We didn't see a proposal that was before the Congress when we developed it on vehicle miles traveled. Um, I, you're absolutely right. In fact, um, the evidence is what's happened over the last 20 years. The, the U.S. auto industry has made spectacular increases in performance and efficiency, but they've been in, erased by increased size of the vehicles and by increased vehicle miles traveled. So our consumption has gone up. We haven't put it into reduced consumption of gasoline. Um, the uh, recommendations of the United States Climate Action Partnership include the recognition that any policy on transportation has to address the, the technology of the vehicle, the fuels, and vehicle miles traveled. Um, that means a combination of policies that address alternative uh, uh, transportation means and uh, getting at some of the land use issues that tend to force us to travel long ways to get to work. Mr. Chairman, I would hope that there would be time on our agenda at some point, uh, actually maybe even a hearing in Oregon where we have done some of this work. Uh, Mr. Inslee has some of it in his book. Uh, where we can look at some of the policies that would give people more choices that would end up reducing vehicle miles traveled. Uh, in our community, uh, because we drive four miles per day less on average than the national average, we're saving uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of gasoline and over a billion dollars in savings to our constituents. I think it's something that would be a lot of fun to explore and would love to offer some suggestions about where to do it. We will be in Portland, Oregon for <laughs> before long, we promise. Thank you, Mr. Okay, thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the other gentleman from Oregon, Mr. <laughs> Walton. And, and we could, after the Portland hearing, you could come out to say Burns or somewhere and look at great distances traveled <laughs> and the need for bigger vehicles. Um, we'd like to take a look at that because we need to get efficiency in those as well. I want, I want to talk, uh, Mr. Izzo, Izzo, I'm sorry. Um, you made a statement, and I just want to make sure I heard it correctly, that solar power was, going, was it $5,000 a kilowatt hour to $8,000 a kilowatt hour? Uh, hopefully, I, hopefully I did not use the units kilowatt hour. You it's did. A, okay, kilowatt. 
installed, the installed value is five to eight thousand dollars per kilowatt value. installed. Now, yeah. could you translate that as a rate payer? What is it per kilowatt hour? Yeah, per kilowatt hour, depending upon the amount of sun the, and, and the conditions, but in New Jersey, that would be typically about 70 cents per kilowatt hour, which is quite a bit cents. more expensive than uh, fossil fuel. And what would the fossil fuel rate be uh, Typically about seven cents per kilowatt hour. So about 10 times. Yeah, so, some would say that it could be as little as seven times, but it's, it's, a multi it's many multiples times more expensive. And what's the energy efficiency rating for solar versus some of these other? Uh, um, if I'm interpreting the question right, in terms of dollars per ton of CO2 saved, solar would cost about $500 in New Jersey per ton of CO2. But that then doesn't account for any of the NOx savings, the SO2 savings, the sure. mercury savings, the particulate savings. But what about energy generation efficiency? For example, I know oh, hydro. Oh, it's about 15%. It's, what about, is it? it's about a 15% conversion rate in New Jersey. Okay, now I want to make sure you and I are talking the same talk here, because like I'm told for hydropower, which we have a lot of in the Northwest and in other select areas around the country, we're almost you know, 90 to 100% efficient in generation ah, conversion. Yes. So are we talking the same thing here, that uh, solar is what percent? Yeah, no, we're not talking the same thing right. in that regard. I was talking about how often the solar energy is available to be right. converted into electricity. I don't know the answer to that question about the overall efficiency of the solar panel in converting uh, the sunlight into electricity. Okay. We could get that for it. I and don't know that number. We're actually working on a project in my district that would incorporate at least solar and perhaps wind uh, on an old military installation. And I'm, I'm fascinated by, by the prospect, and we're working with the Air Force to try and work with the National Guard to try and free up the mm -hmm. site with the state and, uh, and develop these alternative sites. And I'm just curious as to the efficiencies and the costs and all and how we can move that one forward. Um, I, I, I want Mr. Carson, I think, uh, back to the issue of vehicle emissions and all. It, it seemed to me when I was on the Energy and Air Quality um, Subcommittee trip to Europe, there was a lot of discussion we had about the differences in air quality uh, legal standards in Europe versus the United States, and that perhaps we have a much higher uh, standard uh, under the Clean Air Act than, than Europe. And I, I'm curious if you know about that and, and what the differences are, especially as they relate to diesel fuel usage in, in Europe and the emissions there and the deaths that are attributed to that versus here. I think it's about 10 times as many people die from dirty air in Europe is here, and we don't want to go down a path that, you know, exports that here, for example. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the issue you're referring to is that in uh, Europe, uh, the um, strategic decision was made by the governments to give a different emission standard to petrol vehicles uh, than to diesel vehicles. Okay. Different in that uh, it was recognized that diesel vehicles were much lower emitters of CO2, sure. but they were higher emitters of other pollutants like NOx and uh, particulates. Uh, so the Europe has been tolerant to that issue and had two different standards for the different vehicles, whereas uh, here in the US there, there, there was no tolerance to that uh, issue. Uh, so the, the standards are the same, uh, wh whichever kind of engine uh, uh, is, uh, is used. And that made uh, the supply of diesel engine uh, vehicles in America very difficult. Uh, and uh, if for, you a number, for a number of years and, until now, sorry to interrupt you, uh, where the technology has been driven forward right. and now uh, it is possible to meet the same standards in diesel and petrol engines uh, with more advanced uh, catalyst in, technology. In, did I hear you say that the standards in, in Europe for the, the petrol vehicles are the same as in the United States now for emissions? Broadly, yes. And they, and they always have been. Uh, and so the, the, the new standard for diesel in Europe would pass air quality standards in the United States? Uh, it's very hard to do a like for like uh, uh, because the, the drive cycles are also different in, in Europe. The driving, uh, the driving pattern in Europe is somewhat faster uh, than in, uh, in the U.S. So the, the, the test is actually different. Okay. Uh, but, um, but broadly, uh, the emission standards in 2010 in Europe for both diesel and petrol vehicles will be pretty much the same as the emission standards in the, in the toughest states in, uh, in North America and California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognized the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lash. I want to ask about your uh, suggestions, CAP suggestions, about the cap-and-trade system. And you're, you, uh, 
You testified that you suggested that a significant portion of the allowances be initially distributed free uh, to capped entities and economic sectors, particularly disadvantaged by the cap. Uh, could you talk about what you think should be that targeting of, of those if we are going to have some free allocation, you know, how should that be targeted? Uh, um, on behalf of U.S. CAP, I can't tell you very much more because for now what we've agreed on is the language you just read out loud. Mm -hmm. So let me offer some thoughts as an individual. Um, mm -hmm. There are 20, 25 states uh, in the country whose electrical utilities are heavily dependent on coal. Uh, and any way you look at it, if we begin to put a price on carbon, um, the, the rates will go up more quickly in those states than, than the others that have nuclear, uh, hydro, uh, et cetera. So some, there is a belief that, that an allocation to those utilities for some transitional period will help ease any price shock. A second option is to look at earned allocations. So if a utility proposes for example, to make a major investment in carbon capture and storage, uh, free allocations would be one way that the legislation could reduce the cost, which was, is another 30 percent or so on the cost of a power plant, to set up carbon capture and storage. Um, a third option uh, would be to uh, look uh, t through the utilities to the ratepayers uh, and try to find some way of equalizing burdens for ratepayers. I, I personally believe that's quite complicated. Uh, you also went on, CAP also suggests that the, uh, the free allocations be phased out over a reasonable period of time. Why? I mean, could you give me the rationale for an auction, I guess, to begin with? Um, an auction is economically most efficient. You are assuring that those who make the biggest investment in reducing CO2 get the biggest economic benefit. So a, a, a covered entity, whether it's a, an industry or a utility, that makes a, a major investment, for example, in um, methane to uh, electricity from a landfill and is essentially operating at, at zero CO2 emissions, um, ought to get a very large benefit. One way to assure that is to have an auction of credits and then they don't have to buy any credits. A second uh, question is how you use the revenues from the auction. It gives you a chance to put the revenues back into uh, programs, as I think Mr. Inslee recommended, uh, to accelerate the adoption of technology or offset costs to low-income consumers. And by the way, we haven't talked about this, and, and I agree with you that the huge portion of investment will come from the private sector, but would any of you like to comment on the pathetically weak U.S. R&D budget from the federal government, which is one-sixth of what it was in the Apollo project? Would any of you like to agree with my assessment of that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's unanimous. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, I want to ask our friends from Europe, if you want to give us a critique of the cap and trade system, uh, maybe the top three lessons you've learned from your experience. We were in Europe looking at it. We drew some conclusions. I'd be interested in, in yours. Well, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, Europe had a um, trade system in carbon certificates which uh, did not work at the beginning, and I think we should learn from that. It did not work because there were simply too many certificates issued at the beginning. And the reason for that was that each country was allowed to issue as many certificates as it felt was necessary. So they all protected their own industry and issued as many as possible. So as a result of that, the price of carbon collapsed and it obviously failed to reach um, the objective set. The lesson is obviously to be much more restrictive at the level of the number of certificates to be issued. And I think um, you can expect the European Commission at the end of this year to set targets um, for 2009 that will be um, a lot more restrictive. The second observation is that it is probably wrong to let every national entity decide how many certificates they need to issue. This should be brought at EU level for obvious coordination reasons. 
And in fact, that leads to a third lesson, which is probably to say, at some stage, recognizing that the fight against global climate change is a global fight, one could envisage a situation where it would, it would be a supranational entity that would be in charge of issuing um, carbon certificates. Whether that is some sort of subset of the UN, some sort of equivalent to the World Bank for carbon trade, um, I leave open to your own wisdom. The presidency that would be determined by the winner of the World Cup, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. I thank the chairman, I thank the panelists, and I want to continue on the same uh, line of questioning, having, having had the fortunate opportunity to travel to Europe with the chairman and the speaker. Uh, but my question is a little bit different. Um, I believe that the best system for us to proceed on is a carbon tax. I believe that it's uh, more simplified, it's more direct, you don't have to have any specific economic knowledge to implement it. You don't create any new bureaucracy. Uh, many uh, countries in Europe have utilized it successfully and are greener and far ahead. Uh, I understand the pragmatic uh, political applications here in our own country. You say taxes and our colleagues on the other side of the aisle just uh, go into almost apoplectic seizure. And there isn't, you know, in election years oftentimes, the uh, desire to move forward, albeit uh, I'm agnostic with respect to a cap and trade system. But in an issue as vital as this, as critical as this is to the nation, and as Mr. Griset said, to the globe, uh, and we project out into the future, and while it's very important for the United States to step up to the plate and, and lead the way. Ultimately, we're looking at major na nations on the verge of uh, industrial liftoff, like India and China, whose major resource is carbon. And ironically, turn to Western Europe and the United States and say, so you want to put a cap and trade system on us after you've already put up most of the carbon into the atmosphere. So my question is, isn't it fairer and more direct and more efficient to go to a system that taxes carbon, taxes something that we know is bad and know is harmful, and in return have payroll deduction relief for American citizens? Your response. Chairman, can I make a quick comment on that? I'm sure my colleagues will also want to uh uh, comment, but the, I guess the, the uh, beauty of the, the cap system uh, is that in Europe the debate has been, um, has been revolving around how do we keep the level of CO2 in the atmosphere below a certain level, be it 550 parts per, per billion or, or what, whatever that level is, in order to limit the, uh, the, the temperature rise of the planet in, in the future. And if you, have, if you have a cap, I guess you have some certainty. Uh, that you'll get to that. Uh, Where's that, that the limit. transparency and the accountability in that? Well, uh, you know, there, there could be some calculations done. I, uh, I'm assuming uh, that will that will mean uh, a cap has more uh, bearing on the uh, on the on the outcome than a tax, which uh, I guess ahead of time you don't know how much tax you have to uh, uh, have to have to have to uh, set, and then. You don't know the effect of that tax in, in reducing uh, CO2 output. But again, I guess the, the, the experts are the, uh, the governments of, uh, of Europe who've come to that decision. Do you have any? Uh... What, what, what I'd like to add to that is that I don't think any measure taken on its own is going to provide the right solution. So I think that if we take a long-term view, you're probably looking at a mixture of cap and trade, fiscal, and long-term standards. Now, to come on the long-term standards, I think it is really, really important that we provide industry with a long-term certainty in respect of the standards they will have to meet, because that will drive them to do the long-term, very, invest very expensive investment that they will require to do to meet or beat those standards. And by setting them up front now, 
we give our respective industries the opportunity to become market leaders in those technologies. And that is how we will basically be able to deal with the threat, the competitive threat of emerging countries. The reality is, I don't think we can escape the consequences of climate change. And what looks like moderately embarrassing or annoying regulations today or taxations today will be very mild compared to what will be needed in 10 years' time or 15 years' time if we don't do anything. So by pushing it now, by incentivizing this research now, we give industry a chance to really become very, very competitive by the time it will be required. Mr. Lash? The, as you know, uh, U.S. CAP recommended cap and trade rather than a tax, although a tax could be included as a complementary measure to pick up those parts of the economy that a cap system isn't applied to. The reasons are really the ones uh, that were just explained by Mr. Grisset, the, the wish for certainty as to the level of emissions and the, the path of reducing uh, emissions. Um, I would add one observation myself. I, I know, Congressman, that you've been looking closely at the idea of tax shift, which is very appealing as a way of improving equity as well as the environment. Our experience in working with companies for 15 years now has been uh, that price signals don't work as quickly as they should. Um, that I know economists say there are no $10 bills lying on the floor, but it, with the companies we've worked with, there have been some. Uh, quite a lot. <clears throat> and this is a, a case where we need to get the action started from large emitters quickly. Gentlemen, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Carson, uh, we are, um, of course, uh, having a, some debate here uh, uh, over uh, carbon tax, uh, and as uh, Mr. Larson mentioned, you know, you, uh, the word tax in some quarters is almost reason for civil war, but uh, is it at all possible for Europe to have one system and the United States another? Considering the fact that, that we are, if not a, already a global economy, we're moving almost hourly toward that. I think the important issue is that all the economies get to do something. Uh, and harmonization of that uh, something is, is something that ought to follow later. Uh, that's my, my personal view. Uh, we've never had the same system of uh, tax regime on fuel for cars uh, for a, a very long period of time, and that's driven uh, differences in the, in the market. Uh, and I understand that uh, you know, tax on fuel is an emotive uh, issue uh, here. Uh, it seems that there's been less emotive in, um, in Europe over the last uh, 20 years. So I think uh, if, there's, if there's a view that um, we must wait until everybody's lined up with the same system, before implementing it, then that, that, that'll take too long, uh, is my personal view. And, uh, and, and some action, just like in Europe with the, uh, the, the action on um, uh, cap and trade, which wasn't perfect, uh, at least it was a starting point from which we can uh, build. Uh, and I think that's the, that ought to be uh, the way we operate and the head towards a global uh, agreement later. Do, do you or Mr. Grichet say, um have any idea of, uh, of the estimate of uh, the um, carbon dioxide output per individual in, in, uh, in the UK? Uh, I think uh, Germany, for example, is around 11. The United States is 20. I think the UK has a, a modest but nevertheless frightening 2 percent contribution to the total emissions. So. Uh, what are the reasons why the action needs to be global and not just restricted to the UK. Um, but if I can come back just to what yes. was said a second ago, I think there's two different objectives in my mind. One is to get carbon level down fast across the globe. And that may imply indeed different approaches on different continents and different countries. But there is a second objective, which is to make sure that industry remains competitive. 
that we create a growing economy, that we do create jobs. And that's about making industry competitive. And that's where I'm coming back to making sure that standards are being set so that there is a long-term guidance as to where industry needs to reach. It would be much more practical to have similar standards because otherwise those countries that have the stricter standards are by definition going to be a lot more competitive going forward. So I would add a word of warning there. Um, you may take a different point of view on taxes, but on standards, I think it would be very useful if we had some sort of global approach. Thank you. Mr. One last question, Mr. Lash. Uh, <clears throat> are you at all familiar with the American Electric uh, Power um, Settlement with the EPA and a number of other uh, not-for-profit entities? Yes. Uh, do you think that settlement, uh, $4.6 billion over a 10-year uh, period, will have uh, any impact on corporate America? I mean, the, a positive impact where people recognize that if you pollute, you, you're going to have to pay enormously, um, and, and therefore people will move into some kind of compliance without government I, Congressman, I started working on environmental issues in Washington about the time that Congressman Markey uh, arrived in Washington. And I started as a litigator for NRDC suing companies uh, because they seemed to just refuse to meet national standards. My kind of lawyer. Yeah. yeah. And I've moved uh, to a completely different approach to these issues. Now I spend half my time working with the CEOs of, of big companies. I don't think that's just because I've, you know, crossed the 60-year-old line. Um, we've seen a huge change in approach and attitudes from companies as a new generation has taken over. They see it as in their commercial interest to address environmental uh, issues proactively. Um, and I, I think that that's what gives me hope that we're going to be able to address the climate change issue. I do think that the good companies need to be backed up by EPA by knowing that if there are companies that violate the laws, they're going to be penalized. Um, otherwise, there's always the risk that a company that's meeting high standards uh, has to compete with somebody who isn't. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Sir Seth Sandler. Thank you, and thank you to all our witnesses today. I'd like to explore an, um, uh, an area that we haven't touched on yet, and that's agriculture as a participant in a cap and trade system. And in response to Mr. Inslee's questions, Mr. Grisset, I, I think you know a number of helpful observations on what has worked effectively, maybe what hasn't worked effectively, and lessons to be learned. Uh, we did uh, come to find when we traveled earlier this year uh, in some meetings in London that agriculture is not a participant uh, in the European emissions trading system, I, for one, feel strongly uh, that if the United States adopts a cap-and-trade system, that agriculture must be a participant and have some constituents and companies in South Dakota and throughout our region that are working on appropriate measures uh, for how you um, uh, value what grazing or farming techniques um, and how you uh, how you measure those. So the response that I received in the London meeting about why agriculture isn't part of the European system is sort of disagreement about how you a accurately measure and appropriately measure. So I'm wondering if, if you would cite that as a lesson learned in, in moving forward, including agriculture. And Mr. Lash, if you have any thoughts uh, as well. I, I think it's a very relevant question. Uh, agriculture, in my mind, should be included. I think the, the whole issue about um, biofuels is really one of first recognizing that there is probably very substantial potential in that industry, but that we need to do a better job at understanding the full life cycle of the development of those products, because it appears that the so-called first generation of biofuel products uh, may not come from sustainable sources, and that we may, in the course of producing them, either be totally inefficient or actually cause damage. So the issue in my mind is to be very open-minded towards agriculture and biofuels, but making sure that we develop new technologies and the so-called second generation of biofuels, which would come, for instance, from sustainable 
land, probably not from food crop, and probably use mostly wasteland or high fiber content products. So there is a future there, but again, one that requires investments and investigation. I was hoping you were going to bring up this issue. Uh, I one aspect of it needs to be addressed in whatever climate change legislation you pass, and that is the question of whether agriculture can participate as a seller of credits into a trading system under a cap. It, it's an opportunity for uh, farmers uh, and uh, larger scale operators to make reductions, to sequester carbon, and then to get credits for it. Um, a second, uh, and, and the question of measurement, um, I think we've made some progress on. The, the voluntary carbon exchange that operates in Chicago, uh, Chicago Climate Exchange, has in fact done quite a lot of work uh, on measurement of agricultural offsets so that they could be included in the CCX system. Uh, the U.S. CAP recommendations would allow agricultural offsets to be included. The second set of issues are ones that would be uh, covered in other legislation relating to the whole I issue of biofuels, um, uh, technical assistance to the agricultural community, um, and the movement from corn-based ethanol to cellulosic ethanol from waste materials or forest products. Thank you. And, and that leads to my other questions in, in terms of beyond biofuels, wind, solar, the health of our forests and enhancing them as carbon sinks. Uh, but would you agree with me that to achieve the potential uh, that we have with the renewables of wind, solar, uh, wind and solar in particular, but then with biofuels uh, and the flex fuel vehicles that are being manufactured and getting cafe credits, but yet the availability of the fuel not being uh, as comprehensive as we would like, that in addition to whatever investments we make at the federal government level in R&D combined with private sector investment in technology, that the federal government has to make investments and perhaps impose requirements as it relates to transmission capability across the country to get the wind resources from the Great Plains to other parts of the country, as well as the fuel distribution infrastructure uh, to make sure that we are achieving both the objectives of energy security and the positive climate impact. Um, again, not speaking on behalf of U.S. CAP because we haven't addressed this. The transmission issues are very, very real, particularly because wind power is growing so fast. I would defer to Mr. Izzo in terms of the specifics of how best to address that. We are a firm believer in open access to transmission, uh, however, not simply designating what type of supply would get earmarked a slice of that transmission, but letting the market determine what the best solutions are for moving power back and forth. But the specific answer to your question is yes, there's clearly a need for transmission infrastructure to move renewable energy from the places that are uh, more suitable for, for siting and building those facilities. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Lady's time has expired. Here's what I'd like to ask each of you to do, to give us a two-minute summation of what you want the committee to remember uh, as we're moving forward. We have uh, an energy bill that we're trying to resolve between the House and the Senate over the next six weeks, which would be the most historic energy bill in the last 30 years here in the United States. Uh, and subsequent to that, um, we have an intention to uh, take up a, um, the debate on uh, climate change in terms of a cap-and-trade system or, uh, as Mr. Larson <coughs> is saying, and Senator Dodd, a, a carbon tax. Uh, but uh, the Speaker of the House has said that she wants a, a bill that passes that has a mandatory cap-and-trade uh, system that reduces our emissions by 80 percent here in the United States. Uh, so this energy bill is up right now. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can resolve that in the next uh, six weeks, and then we will move on. So let's go in reverse order, give each one of you a two-minute uh, summation so that you can tell us how you believe we should be viewing these issues uh, and your recommendations as to how we should proceed. We'll begin with you, Mr. Lash. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would begin by echo echoing what you were saying just a moment ago. The, the energy bill is a very good first step. Um, the energy efficiency provisions, the renewable provisions will make a significant difference for both of the issues mentioned in the, the title of this uh, committee. 
Um, and it's, it's there, it's available, it's waiting to be passed. It, it will reduce costs for the country, ultimately. Um, secondly, uh, we should not assume that it isn't possible to pass strong uh, greenhouse gas reduction legislation in this Congress. Uh, I met with Senator Lieberman yesterday. Uh, I believe that the, the Senate uh, Environment Committee will get a strong bill out uh, this year. Uh, and I think there's a real potential. Um, the important thing is to keep our eye on the ball, to remember that we need legislation that gives industry and investors a long-term roadmap that we're going to start reductions and continue reductions over a period of decades so that they can make investments in light of those signals. Thank you, Mr. Lash. Uh, Mr. Grisset. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just summarize conversations I've had before with Prime Minister Blair Brown and President Barroso on, on that very question. And I think the, uh, the strong message I would like to share with you is that um, there is a need for urgent action. We just cannot wait. And uh, there are opportunities and risks in front of us, um, but the cost of delaying is, is just absolutely staggering. And maybe one suggestion there is to see the U.S. Congress um, supporting the equivalent to a stern review, as was done uh, in the UK, in mm -hmm. case there were still people around who had some doubts. Um, practically speaking, I look forward to you implementing, as part of the energy bill, binding regulations, and I would certainly welcome a mixture of cap and trades, fiscal measures, and standards for energy efficiency going forward, because I think all three are necessary for the reasons that, uh, that we discussed. Thank you, Mr. Grisset. Mr. Carson. Similar message from me, Chairman. Urgent action required. Uh, not one solution, but very many solutions to this issue. Some are simple, and some we must be getting on with right away, and I'm sure business is now getting on with its uh, resource efficiency uh, issues, because that's going to save money. Uh, but the, other, the others that need a technology solution also need to go hand in hand with a framework for uh, future binding targets uh, in order that uh, uh, industry can spend its own money in finding those solutions. And we and uh, our colleagues are very keen to work together uh, with governments to try and make that happen sensibly. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Uh, Mr. Izzo. Uh, with regard to the energy bill before the Congress now, there are two imperatives that we would identify. Number one is elimination of the investment tax credit exclusion for utilities to participate in solar energy so that we can help in, uh, develop solar power in a least cost method. Number two would be incentives for states to encourage utility participation in energy efficiency in ways that benefit both customers and investors. On the broader issue of a global climate change legislation, we would argue that a bill with reduction targets and timetables that are strong enough to obviate the need for regional and state programs is an imperative. Uh, regional and state programs will create competitive distortions that could actually not only raise rates for customers but result in environmental degradation through a phenomenon known as leakage. We've heard already about the importance of harmonization at the international level and at the EU level. It seems to me that a national, single national greenhouse gas emissions credit trading market would be an obvious first place for us to begin here in the United States. Thirdly, a fair allocation approach in the electric sector that acknowledges the investments already made by companies in cleaner technology and incents those types of investments going forward. And lastly, consum consumer protections in the form of assistance for low-income customers from any proceeds that are derived from uh, auctioning of allowances. Thank you, Mr. Izzo, very much. And as you know, much of what you're recommending is in either the House or the Senate energy bill right now. And um, and we'll fight to maintain that because I do agree with you that the utility sector has a huge role to play and we have to construct a, a newer and smarter set of incentives for the utility industry to fully participate. Um, and I want to actually tell you this too, especially our friends from across the ocean, that the energy bill that we're considering uh, and we're debating over the next six weeks, uh, if the best elements of it uh, remain intact and are in the final package, it would meet by 2030 40 percent of the United States goal um, to uh, reduce uh, uh, heat trapping gases uh, that the United States has to uh, do in order to save our planet, 40 percent of our goal. So 
because we're dealing with uh, the electric utility industry and the automotive sector, buildings, uh, all of the appliances in our country combined, uh, that 40 percent number is something that is very realistic in terms of uh, the contribution to climate change. And I think set the stage, um, as Mr. Lash said, for uh, a more comprehensive climate change bill, but not to understate what 40 percent means uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, demonstrating the, the, the resolve that the United States has to deal with these issues and send a signal to the rest of the world that we no longer will be the laggard, but rather a leader in, in setting standards. And I think that's a very important statement for us to make. So this, this bill that's pending before us is very, very important. Um, and, uh, uh, and if we have a 40 percent solution by 2030, uh, I think that the rest of it will uh, be able to be followed on because it will give the utility industry, the automotive industry, and all other sectors a stake then in finding uh, a way to put together a comprehensive uh, cap and trade system, uh, uh, which uh, ultimately I think will become a model for the rest of the world partnering with the EU. So we thank uh, each of our witnesses. We thank Prince Charles for uh, his contribution to our hearing today. Uh, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.